Um, and then if time allows, maybe a quick look at the new uh, Before You Fly app from the FAA. This is kind of our FAA update segment. And um, so uh, I'm sure you're all probably aware that uh, registration has become required for certain aircraft, probably for a, a large portion of the small unmanned aircraft systems. And uh, this applies to whether it's for hobby and recreational use, commercial use, or under the public aircraft statutes. And um, these uh, different categories here are, play a big role in defining how you go about uh, registering and the way you interact with the FAA at this point in time. Um, and we'll took it, take a little bit closer look at these. Uh, as we uh, go forward through these next few minutes. So um, this registration is focused on small unmanned aircraft systems that are operated outdoors. So if you're operating or flying indoors or in a uh, netted area, for example, where the uh, aircraft cannot get away from you into the beautiful blue sky, then um, this, these requirements don't apply. But if you're ever going to fly an unmanned aircraft out of doors, then you really need to start taking a look at these new rules. So um, one of the, the thresholds that the FAA put into place was uh, takeoff weight. And if that takeoff weight is less than about a half a pound, 0.55 pounds, or 250 grams, then uh, registration is not required. And I've heard this described as maybe something like a couple of sticks of butter. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you're kind of off the hook there. And this is you know, getting to these smaller units and um, something that uh, the FAA doesn't really want to have to deal with in their paperwork and their, their tracking. Um, however, if the takeoff weight is more than 0.55 pounds and less than 55 pounds, registration is required. And um, if you're uh, uh, using these for hobby purposes, then you would use the new Part 48 registration process. And uh, that's uh, as noted at the bottom of the page here. Um, see if I can grab the arrow. There it is. So part 48 process is the web-based system. And for anybody else that's been through the uh, traditional aircraft registration with the FAA, that takes place in Oklahoma City. And it's a paper-based process. That's part 47 process. And then if the uh, takeoff weight is greater than 55 pounds, you're no longer qualified as a small unmanned aircraft system and you're going to be pushed into the Part 47 process, the, the standard uh, paper process. So that would be for mid-size, large-size unmanned aircraft. Move this arrow here a little bit. OK, so how about compliance dates for this registration? This is where things get just a little bit confusing. Um, and. Uh, Let's take a look at that here. Try to grab my arrow. Take a look at the first one. So if the small unmanned aircraft system is used exclusively as a model aircraft, and I put in parentheses here for hobby and recreational purposes, that has never been used, in other words, it's still in the box, it's brand new, then the compliance date starts December 21. 2015. And that's under this new Part 48 process that the FAA has put into place. However, if you're using a small unmanned aircraft exclusively as a model aircraft and it's been operated by the owner prior to December 21st, then you have a little bit of a leeway. You have until February 19th, 2016. And that would utilize the new Part 48 process, which is internet-based. It's very simple, very straightforward. 
this is where things get a little bit different now here too um, because we know there are other types of flight operations and the FAA describes these as being used in authorized operations as other than model aircraft. So authorized oper operations here would be maybe something like a Section 333 exemption or something like a, uh, a under a public entity a, and under the public aircraft statutes. So either one of those cases. Um, to register your aircraft you continue to use the old paper based Part 47 process until March 31st, 2016. Then, if you're using a, a flying a small unmanned aircraft in authorized operations, so that means it's authorized, as other than a model aircraft, you can either continue to use the old paper-based Part 47 process or shift to the new Part 48 internet-based process. And again, that's uh, March 31st, and it kind of makes sense because the uh, FAA needs to build in a little bit more infrastructure and information capability to handle the uh, um, commercial uh, types of uh, applications and flying registration. Okay. Um, there's also age considerations and use of the small unmanned aircraft systems, again flying outside. Um, if the age of the aircraft owner is less than 13 years of age and it's used as a model aircraft, um, it would need to be registered by a person who is at least 13 years of age. And um, the interesting point here, and if you've gone through the registration process, it's not real clear, but I put a little note down here, that when the unmanned aircraft is used as a model aircraft, the operator registers once, and then a single registration number is used for all aircraft owned by the operator that are used as model aircraft. So if you're registration number is 123XYZ and that's what is assigned to you by the FAA then and you've got five unmanned aircraft, small unmanned aircraft, then you'd put that 123XYZ on every one of your small unmanned aircraft. Um, and then if the unmanned aircraft is used in authorized operations other than model aircraft, for example, commercial or under the public aircraft statutes, this is where things get different. Each aircraft is registered separately and issued a certificate of registration. So it's this point right here that is likely resulting in a delay in the FAA um, uh, developing that information system to handle those kinds of registrations. And that's why I, I believe anyway it's a March 31st date that they've set for that to give them a little bit of time to bring that technology forward. Um, the type of information that you need to provide and the fee is noted here. Um, we've got uh, uh, for uh, um, authorized operations other than as a model aircraft. Uh, you need to provide an applicant name, physical address, and mailing address if different than physical. The uh, applicant email address, and this is really important because that's really how they prefer to interact with uh, individuals that are registering their system, although they do have a, a paper-based approach. Um, and and that's, that information is available on the FAA website under their Unmanned Aircraft Systems uh, um, uh, web page. Um, for the commercial and public uh, aircraft statutes, you need to provide an aircraft manufacturer and model name and serial number if available. 
And this is where things are a little bit different than the uh, model uh, aircraft recreation use. You don't have to pro provide this information under that type of registration, but for the uh, um, operations other than as a model aircraft, this becomes important. Manufacturer, model name, and serial number because each aircraft is going to be assigned its own registration number. And then there's kind of a catch-all. Other information is required by the administrator. And uh, I'm not sure what that would be, but that's kind of allows the FAA flexibility to change this as it goes forward. And then the fee is $5. And if you get it registered real soon, you'll get your $5 register, uh, registration fee refunded. And I mean real soon. Um, how about the certificate itself? Well, it's uh, delivered by um, the uh, email, the same email that uh, you gave to the FAA. And by the way, there's a kind of a, a second step there. You enter, an F uh, you enter your name and your email, and then the FAA sends a, re a, certifi a registration certification kind of test to that email. You've got to go to your email, click on it, and then it actually activates your ability to register. So they do a little check on the email to make sure it's a valid email address. Anyway, they send uh, the registration there. You can print it, maybe even laminate it in plastic and, and retain it on your possession. Uh, the information on the certificate is the uh, owner name, issue date, and registration number. Uh, there is a renewal every three years, and that uh, $5 fee repeats. And then the uh, registration number uh, needs to be displayed on all small unmanned aircraft. Uh, and that unique identifier then is uh, either associated with the owner, in the case of model-based systems, or the specific aircraft in the case of uh, commercial or public agency use. Okay, so that's kind of the uh, um, certificate of registration and the registration process in a nutshell. Um, I did want to also visit a little bit about the uh, new smartphone app, uh, Before You Fly, and uh, this is available on the FAA website. And um, one of our uh, team members in the Learning Network uh, sent this article to me, and the person that wrote the article indicated that, uh, in this case, they're sitting here where the red dot is, and the app showed a number of airports nearby, along with some helipads. And, uh, by the way, this is Castle Rock, Colorado. To the north is Denver, and to the south is uh, Colorado Springs. And um, it was interesting because the individual made the note that under this uh, app, it's kind of showing, uh, you know, this is a warning area because of proximity to airports and helipads. Um, noting here in the, the, the five mile radius is noted, and so you get these overlaps, and my gosh, yeah, there it looks like there could be a, a problem here. But what I'd like to do is, I, I dug a little deeper into this um, because I was curious about um, how this really worked out in terms of the sectional, the FAA sectional. So keep an eye on these three airports here. Kind of make a note of where they are relative to the individual that wants to fly their unmanned aircraft system. Just to the east, to the southeast, and to the south. And uh, another one here down by Larkspur, but, but it's not in his uh, radius of influence. Now I'm going to change the screen here to a, a sectional, and I want to draw your attention to some features on the sectional that I found interesting in terms of what the FAA app is showing compared to what a uh, pilot would see on their sectional. Okay, so here's the sectional for the same area. Here's Castle Rock right here, and this uh, green dot approximates where the uh, flyer is located. And then based on the roads on the uh, FAA app, I located where the three airports would be. These kind of blue lines here are roads, so I positioned them. So here's the one to the east, to the southeast, and to the south. And then here's Larkspur here. You can see Larkspur, and here's the Larkspur Airport 
it's got a circle around it, around the red dot. So what's interesting here is that you'll notice these red dots don't have any circle around them. Any uh, There's no uh, note on the sectional that there's an airport there. And in fact, in the individual that wrote the article, uh, in his commentary about the app, he made note that there's, there's really no airports where it's showing that there are airports. Um, where you see airports, and the airports identified on a sectional are these circles here, and I put red dots in the middle. They're way out here to the east, for example. These are private airports. And then here's uh, Kelly Field. It's also a private airport. And I put a red dot here to the south. So I'm not real sure what's going on here. This is showing airports about here, but the sectional shows airports out here. But the interesting thing to me that I made note of is the features that the app, the Before You Fly app, does not show that you might want to be aware of. So for example, this dashed line here comes down and around, and it connects up to this circle here. That's Class D airspace. Right up above here, it's just off the screen, is Centennial Airport on the south side of Denver. And this Class E airspace, which the green dot is clearly within, is um, that's a uh, controlled airspace all the way to ground surface. So that's kind of interesting, which didn't show up. Um, there's also this thick gradient line here, which is Class E airspace from uh, 700 foot AGL up. Um, so that's, you know, a little less of a concern, but it's still there. It kind of covers large areas. Uh, there's uh, this uh, magenta colored line here. The solid line is what's called the Mode C Veil for Denver International Airport. And that is a, uh, that's a pretty important line for pilots that might be flying in the area with a uh, airplane, a manned airplane, you really need to have your transponder on and communicating with the uh, airport control tower uh, in order to enter that circle. If you enter that circle um, without doing that, you can get in pretty big trouble. And you generally start doing that as you're approaching from pretty far away, making contact, getting permission to enter. This is uh, Class B airspace for Denver International, and it's uh, pretty big airspace. So again, the flyer right here is pretty much on that boundary there. It could maybe even be within that Mode C veil. That goes from uh, um, surface up. Um, the uh, other item here I made note of is this blue line here that the flyer is definitely under is Class B airspace. That is active Class B airspace. It runs from 9,000 foot above sea level to 12,000 foot above sea level. Sounds like it's pretty far up there, but keep in mind where this flyer would be at is already at 7,000 feet above sea level. So that Class B airspace where you've got uh, airlines, airline transport, your basic uh, United uh, and, and so on is going to be 2,000, potentially 2,000 foot above and flying into Denver International or departing Denver International. Also, down here at Kelly Field, there's intensive glider activity. It says it right here, intensive glider activity monitor, and it gives a frequency. So gliders are going to be operating in this area. And then also, the Air Force Academy is just down here by Colorado Springs. They have a lot of flying going on there, and there's intensive uh, U United States Air Force student training. Um, noted here in this area. So it's a very active uh, flying area that, again, the uh, Before You Fly app from FAA, I didn't think really picked up on all this. I have actually flown in this area, and it's there's a lot going on. You have to be real careful. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I think F the FAA has, I think they've indicated they're going to continue to work on the app.